Okay. Well, I think we're just about live now. And we are live. Hello and welcome Hello. everybody to the fifth episode of Active Measures. I am here with UK heavyweight champion Kit Clarenberg, and I am Alex Rubenstein, a word losing investigative journalist. How are we doing today, Kit? Yeah, good, good. Um, as, 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 as good as I can be, which is maybe not saying very much, but um, here we are. So I think we want to start off the show by addressing a little bit of controversy that we've encountered. Yeah, um, you know, Alex and I have been really blown away by the positive reactions uh, that, that we've got from uh, uh, known and unknown faces um, uh, for active measures. So um, thank you for, uh, please do keep it, t the praise rolling in because it really validates us and, um, and whatnot. But however, not everyone's a fan. Um, it must be said there are, we do have our detractors um, and there's a rather, uh, we've received some indirect hate mail um, from anonymous social media users, um, particularly over um, the show's name. Um, now, have you, have, you got, have you got the tweet up, Alex? I do, yeah. Yeah, so um, there is a user called Deist who complains, it is the term the KGB used for operations to spread disinformation and demoralize the US. <laughs> They're just super blatant with it now, so presumably Alex and I are KGB operatives. Uh, and th they further complain, the NSA knows what porn I watch, but can't shut this shit, i.e. active measures, damn. Damn yeah. right. And um, we'll be... They can't may, shut us down. May, we, should, we should probably have that printed on a t-shirt, actually. I, I think, think so. Uh, yeah. Um, and <laughs> our next tweet. Oh, our counterintelligence can't even take initiative to mess with them the slightest bit if they lack orders, permissions to bring the hammer down, leak their emails with their handlers, flag them for forever audits by IRS, Bust them per for perfectly obnoxious cocaine possession, etc. Yeah, um, I mean, you know, I mean, this is this is the kind of thing that we're up against for um, for, for, for daring not to toe the the Western national security state security state line in all matters. But you know, I suppose it's a price worth paying until or unless we end up in Guantanamo. So we're gonna we're gonna keep going. Um, but yes, we have a rather. Uh, it's been a, a pretty tumultuous week. In well, well, I want I want to bring up I want to bring up um, our graphic designer. I had him, aka my other personality, yes. make a chart um, <laughs> explaining the uh, active measures um, st structure. Yes. So um, yeah, here you we get have that up it on screen. Just it's just for the sake of just for the sake of clarity. the avoidance of all doubt. Yeah. This is this is how we are furthering so, the KGB's malign uh, <laughs> intentions. Yeah. We have in, a chart of charts. Yeah, absolutely. We heard you guys like charts, so we made a chart for your chart. And yeah. let us know if there are any questions about uh, what's going on here. Yeah, indeed, we, indeed. We are I mean, I, I, I mean, I think it's pretty clear. To be fair, like if you email in asking for clarity on this, you're a moron. Like, I mean, it, just, <laughs> it makes it makes so much sense. Um, so do you want to kick us off with our first story? Absolutely. So yes, it's been a rather tumultuous week. Now, um, I am pleased to report that Robert Fico, the Slovakian prime minister who was shot um, by a Ukraine ultra um, and a, a, an aging Slovak poet who was very angry at uh, the um, failure of the Slovakian government to keep arming Ukraine and their opposition to the, keeping this proxy war grinding on um uh, 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 yeah um i i think i mentioned in the last show it's been revealed that he was on the uh the radar of czechoslovak intelligence in the 1980s um and so that raises obvious questions about whether he was working for someone else um at the time and was therefore um you know being being surveilled due to contacts with the west or um uh, nationalist neo-nazi elements but um there has been a major i mean i, I mean fico is now recovering um he had multiple operations and, and was fighting for his life for a, a, a week afterwards um but he it looks like he's going to make a full recovery um slowly but surely which is great news uh, there has not been uh, clashes in the street as we've been seeing in Georgia, uh, which is uh, was a fear of mine that this was a a wider component of a of a color re revolution effort that was meant to kind of kick, yeah, kick off rioting, etc. But so the, the 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 Slovak police are keeping a rather tight shield um, around their investigation and are are trying to prevent anything leaking out, um, but. 
there has been a major development, which is that um, the police um, are working on the assumption that, that the, the shooter was, n was not a lone wolf as his social media assets um, and all associated communication thereof uh, was deleted two hours after the attack happened. So um, quite clearly someone or something else was clear, uh, cleaning up his tracks um, uh, once he'd uh, attempted to kill the Slovak Prime Minister. Um, the problem now, uh, a major problem from the Slovak authorities' perspective, is that they're going to have to rely on getting this information from the FBI now. And therefore, the FBI could very easily uh, suppress things they don't want to the Slovak authorities to see, uh, or indeed um, taint the evidence otherwise. Um, so, but we, you know, we, sh we, we, sh we shall see. Um, it seems to be a, a, a mainstream proposition in Slovakia that uh, this was not the work of, of one person. And we, we contrast this with immediately when... Um, uh, after J uh, JFK got shot in November 1963, um, not by Lee Harvey Oswald, the CIA was working overtime, uh, as was the FBI, to uh, do everything in their power to incriminate Lee Harvey Oswald and Lee Harvey Oswald alone. So it's a quite an interesting yeah. contrast there. Um, but yes, and I think that this leads into, um, I mean, really quite shocking. So I mentioned the, the unrest in Georgia. The Georgian government has now passed its uh, Foreign Influence Act, which compels NGOs to that, that receive funding from abroad to disclose their... their, uh, their this is the statement by the commission. Yeah, they, they disclose their sources of, of, of funding, which seems like quite a reasonable thing. And also it's it, it, the, the legislation in most Western countries not, is not only far more draconian um, on the foreign funding of um, organisations, uh, it criminalises and legalises what NGOs in Georgia are doing expressly. Uh, despite this, the EU has moved to sanction uh, the members of the, the Georgian Dream-led coalition government and indeed parliamentarians who dared vote uh, for in favour of this legislation and also voted to overturn a um, presidential veto by Georgia's president is this French-born um, woman who uh, was at one stage uh, the uh, France's ambassador to Georgia uh, and uh, it sh her inability to speak the Georgian language is widely mocked locally but she's that she was appointed she became a Georgian citizen in 2004 mm -hmm. because Western puppet uh, Mikhail Saakashvili gave her just gave her a passport and then she became the the uh, I think it was the foreign minister yeah because she was know, first a, the foreign minister yeah, yeah yeah because of her you know extensive experience in Georgian politics made her a, <laughs> a, a, a tremendous candidate for this yeah role. A, as I pointed out in my Georgia uh, video um, must watch what what was uh, one thing she said on the campaign trail in uh, Broken Georgian was that the beauty of Georgia allows one to stick things anywhere you want, um, <laughs> which was apparently, uh, she was talking about uh, the great archeology, uh, archeological sites in Georgia. Who, who could tell? Oh yeah, um, indeed, indeed, indeed. But do well, go I on. Think, I, think, I think a lot of Western tourists got the wrong idea um, <laughs> like, <laughs> from, from what she said. But yes, I might add that, so there has been, this has escalated like way out of control um, in Georgia. There are like daily clashes between protesters and police. It's quite clear that the protesters are A, very passionately convinced that this legislation is something really malign and toxic and awful. Um, it's also quite clear that they have been heavily manipulated by anti-government NGOs and, and media organisations, which is to say almost all of them yeah. um, in Georgia. Uh, and they believe that it will compel them to uh, report their neighbours and, um, and all sorts of other um, oh yeah, all, all, all welly, all Orwellian obligations that uh, just aren't part of this. Um, and I, we mentioned this in a previous show, there is an excellent uh, essay by um, uh, uh, Sopo Japaridza and Almut Rochowanski, uh, who are experts on the caucus um, and socialists, and they, have, they talk about what this legislation actually does and doesn't do, um, and also um, talk about the very toxic role that foreign funded NGOs play in so uh, sorry in Georgian society and politics. Now, um, so it, as part of this kind of war between the West and the Georgian government, um, a, 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 the Georgian Prime Minister claimed on the 23rd of May that he had been threatened with the same fate as Robert Fico. Um, uh, Alex, 
Yeah, I, um, I know. Sorry. We have so a cat that's We have a show in. mascot who is being very naughty um, <laughs> at the moment. Um, and uh, it, 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 So I'm it, pulling a Politico. Yeah, 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 okay. yeah, yeah. Sure. But I mean, like the, the full statement is worth is just is worth focusing on as well. I mean, that's the Europa.eu. But it's like, so init- initially the, the European Commission denied that um, that that this had been said to the Georgian authorities, and that you know, we would never say anything like this. And then um, an EU commissioner, um, a Hungarian EU commissioner, admitted that yes, um, uh, he had actually threatened the uh, Georgian prime minister. However, um, he tried to couch this uh, by say stating. Um, during a phone conversation with the Georgian Prime Minister, I felt the need to call the att- call the Prime Minister's attention on the importance not to inflame further the already fragile situation by adopting this law, which could lead to further polarisation and to possible uncontrolled situations on the streets of Tbilisi, which is the Georgian capital. In this regard, the latest tragic event in Slovakia was made as an example and as a reference to where such high-level polarisation can lead in a society in Europe. So, in other words, um, you know, just putting it out there that, like, you, 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 I mean, look at what happened to Robert Fico. Uh, just putting it out. Don't read too much into it. Yeah, but that is probably where it's this worth is going mentioning. to be. It's just, just you know, just, just uh, really drive the point home. I, I'm not saying this is going to happen to you. I'm saying I think this could happen to you if you keep pissing us off. So I, I mean, I, um, as I said on Twitter at the time, I really hope the EU and US like keep this up because they are committing seppuku uh, <laughs> like in a via a thousand self-inflicted cuts they are making i've i've spoken to several georgians who uh, do not consider themselves pro-government and are very much uh concerned about where this legislation could lead in at least in theory um who are now um revising their positions uh, and think that it's absolutely fundamental and it's essential that we have some check on foreign influence in our country because it's completely out of control yeah it's like and i might add as well that this legislation is almost identical to a law the EU is considering passing. Directive, yeah. Uh, an EU directive, which, so if Georgia joins the EU, it will have to adopt exactly the same thing anyway. Yeah. Um, it, but it's that classic mastery analogy, like, you know, step out of line, um, and uh, uh, it's one foot out of line, and you need to get knocked back in. Now, this is what's what's quite amazing as well, is you see how a, a, a form of uh, uh, propaganda is just straight up. Uh, uh, a, pr- a proverbial eraser or rubber, as they would say in the UK. Um, there is a es- an essay on the Carnegie Endowment website. Now, this the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace, of course, it's the opposite thing, um, is a very influential DC-based think tank. Um, and it, it had an essay on its website that was published last year after there was significant um, unrest um, when the government attempted to pass an almost identical um, bit of legislation uh, that, which led to violent crowds threatening to overrun Georgia's parliament. Um, uh, following this um, unrest, Carnegie published an essay on its website effectively stating that it was complete bullshit to suggest that Georgia Dream was in any way pro-Russian. Now it was, uh, the, and they pointed out all of these anti-Russian moves that it had undertaken. Uh, they uh, they pointed out that Georgian Dream had been pushing very, very hard to join the EU and had done things. Um, uh, had sorry, undert- had jumped through every hoop set out for them by Brussels in order to join, um, and had uh, shown uh, a a a, will- a willingness to consistently roll over to the West's demands, and that the State Department had acknowledged that Georgia was was diligently observing international sanctions imposed on Russia and preventing goods transiting to Russia through its territory and, and all sorts, which is very difficult to do because it's this tiny country on the on on the doorstep of this yeah. vast vast landmass that that covers multiple. It's time between to, like the sea, Russia, and yeah, Azerbaijan. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So know? it's like it's very, very it, like all most of Russia's neighboring countries is that this is where. Uh, Russia is is kind of repurchasing things from this is how they're be- one of the many ways they're beating these sanctions we were told would reduce the uh, the, the ruble to rubble um, now this article was cited in this Carnegie Endowment article was cited in that left east essay, essay that I uh, that I just previously mentioned and we we've covered before after it was mentioned 
it was pulled from the web. It's really interesting. So this day they deleted they deleted this because it was too it undermined the narrative that the US and the EU are trying to push. Now I might add, and if we go to a, a, the, the, my my tweet from last year. Um, the, so when these protests erupted last year, I looked at the kind of groups that were being, um, and this is a party trick uh, that everyone can do at home. Uh, <laughs> like the, the, I looked at the groups that were being named, like as at the forefront of these these protests. Now, one of them uh, a, a, against uh, a foreign agent registration act. One of the groups, very prominently, was called Shame Movement. Now, Shame Movement was started in 2019, and it was explicitly founded because Georgian um, uh, youth are very pro-EU, but they didn't engage in political activism. So this was explicitly a means of getting them into into uh, protest and training them to in non-violent resistance, which has been used was previously used to overthrow the Georgian government in two thousand and three. Although yeah. the, uh, the the joke about non-violent resistance is, is actually often very violent. Um, uh, but uh, yeah, so in, in this article, a representative of Shame Movement, this is uh, was quoted stating, oh, and 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 it, it is described in it by I think it was yes, the, I think it was the Washington Post, or it might have been the Wall Street Journal, as a civil society group that promotes EU integration. And they are quoted as saying, Georgian Dream is a proxy party of the Kremlin and all of its moves are aimed at pushing the nation closer to Russia and further from the EU. Now, I immediately went to the NED's website and searched for shame movement. And lo and behold, they get hundreds of thousands yeah. from the National Endowment for Democracy, which, as we've discussed before, was explicitly set up and admittedly set up to carry out overtly what the CIA used to do covertly and Alex has covered this extensively of all of their funding of opposition groups in in Georgia and, and all sorts of anti-government initiatives. Now, well, it's hard, I mean, it's hard to say which groups they fund, too, because yeah, the NED doesn't tell you. It's and, not all public. And, and also the NED, you know, they only give you like a four-year window of of, yeah. of who uh, of what they're funding. But yeah. you can see all the project titles. You can see a description of the project yeah. titles, the date, the, the dollar figure. Uh, you can't see the name of the group. Yeah. So Not always. Um, and I might add that this is, a, I mean, and yeah, the, the NED does not publicize everything they fund, but they also also remove records. Yeah. So um, the in uh, after the invasion of Ukraine in February 2022, um, they immediately removed all of their records related to Ukraine. Uh, the NED was heavily, uh, centrally, uh, predominantly involved in the Maidan revolution. All of the groups and individuals at the forefront were in receipt of NED funding. All yeah. of them. Yeah. Um, and there was a... And the same with the Orange Revolution. Yeah, 2004. Yeah. So that, now, if you go to the last picture in my tweet, um, this was a screen grab of a grant for $90,485 that was given to the shame movement. Um, and you can, I think you can view it in big if you click on Im copy image link. But so this was to promote democratic accountability and effective oversight of the Georgian parliament. Uh, sh uh, the organization will monitor parliament to determine the legislative body's effectiveness in providing executive oversight and lawmaking functions. The grantee will track votes and statements of all parliamentarians and maintain online profiles detailing this information. It will engage in a public advocacy campaign to increase citizen demand for good governance. This was given to, to none other than shame movement which is at the forefront of of, of protest this time as well and is in, featured quoted from uh, liberally across the western media as saying georgian dream is, is a pro-russian anti-eu party which is a lie um and this was removed from the ned's website at some stage yeah uh, it seems quite clear that this grant was concerned with creating like a public hit list of mps who vote the wrong way yeah Therefore, opening them up to sanctions, criticism, and making the, the, the West's job of uh, rooting out fifth columnists, i.e. people. Okay, we are live again. Brilliant. Um, that's, uh, that's on me, folks. Yeah, um, rest assured, audience, um, Alex will be flogged uh, for his <laughs> <laughs> uh, when the show's over. I mean, it's a, it's a weekly institution. It's not true. But, the, uh, but yeah, so as I was saying, I think... Um, if you if you uh, if you're on my tweet and the entry yeah. from NED, so 
It seems pretty clear that shame movement was tasked with creating a hit list of Georgian MPs who voted the wrong way so they could be one way or another punished, ostracised, shamed, in fact, publicly. Um, and this grant for which shame movement received 90,000, over $90,000 has been removed from the Internet um, since the since the protest started. Um, so that's, uh, I mean, that's that's like pre pretty damning. Um, and again, I, th I do think for, for, for a lot of Georgians, um, the fact that the, the, the preponderance of Western officials at the forefront of the unrest and like you have like Lithuanian MEPs flying into Tbilisi to give Maidan style addresses on how Georgians should overthrow their government. Um, it is actually helping the government. Yeah. We saw this in um, in in Belgrade at the start of sorry, well at the end of last year and the start of this year, there were these really rather pathetic opposition protests. Um, I mean, uh, you know, people are free to protest, and um, if if you want to, want to uh, wave EU flags and banners in in Belgrade, be my guest because it will turn everyone off you. But the the point is is that this was framed. It by the Western media as the start of a revolution and this kind of huge upswell of Serbian opinion against autocracy and corruption and all the usual buzzwords. Um, and the Serbian government and indeed Vladimir Putin turned this into a propaganda win because when the protests fizzled out because they had like minimal public support and they also their support fell over time as a result of them doing this because they look like idiots um they claimed that they'd prevented a western coup from happening it was like yeah. a huge propaganda win and you have like rt claiming to have yeah that that, that putin personally intervened to prevent another maidan in serbia so yeah keep talking up this rubbish as um uh, <laughs> as really significant because it will boomerang but um, um, what's not absolutely not rubbish and uh, absolutely isn't insignificant is um, World Socialist website has reported, and this has been large, almost completely ignored, and, and it really needs more eyes on it. Um, one of their contributors is this Ukrainian socialist called Bogdan uh, Sorotyuk. Um, he was jailed um, at the end of, of April this year. And he was he was arrested by uh, Ukraine's SBU and he was thrown in a high security prison where he's being allegedly held in atrocious conditions, quote unquote, um, in the city of Nik Nikolev. Um, and yeah, um, he is a he is a, a Trotskyist and um, was uh, very critical of Russia's invasion. Um, uh, but is also um, under no illusions about the nature of uh, Zelensky's regime and also um, the state-sanctioned neo-Nazism that occurs. Uh, and I think it's, it's, it's really important to, to bear in mind that neo-Nazism is, in wider societal terms, not that widespread in Ukraine at all. Um, and there are a large number of, of left-wingers and anarchists who have taken up arms both voluntarily and um, against their will, due to conscription, against the Ru Russia's invasion. Um, and but uh, it, it, that's his real crime, and it, the indictments which have been shared with me and, and active measures will be doing a, a longer uh, video investigation to this next week, hopefully, um, claim that World Socialist website is a Russian propaganda and information agency, and there, and uh, uh, is is an instrument of an active information war against Ukraine being waged by Moscow, um, which is hilarious because they've like. I've, they've covered some of my exclusive reporting yeah. before, and they've preempted everything by saying, we you know, fascist, fascist gray zone, supporter of, you know, uh, Vladimir Putin, um, had this wonderful exclusive, you yeah, know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, it's, I mean, yeah, it's very, very clear that the, the World Socialist website has been very critical of, of the Grey Zone. They have, to their immense credit, um, uh, repeatedly condemned my detention by yeah. armed counter-terror police in the UK the last time I flew back to that godforsaken paedophile-run island. But um, it, the point is, is yeah, that it, it is part of the indictment that the World Socialist website is run by Russia. And this, they have published countless articles since the start of this condemning it as unprovoked Russian aggression and and the view that it, it's quite clear that they view NATO and Russia as comparable belligerents in this that they that they, that they, it, they do not support the war they've been very critical of of, of the Russian government 
Um, and so uh, it, it, uh, they just view it as a proxy war, which it is. Um, and this, but, but despite this, uh, yes, Bogdan's in jail. Um, I gather from discussions with uh, with people who know him that uh, the, the, the various uh, lawyers who were trying to offer him legal representation have been intimidated into not doing so. So he's denied legal representation. There is, I think, there is a. A, a, an individual within World Socialist website who is who is basically trying to mount his legal defence from yeah. the US, yeah. um, and this is not far from the first time that there has been a politically motivated persecution of dissenting voices um, in Ukraine. Um, and I think that this is a subject that's very close to your heart, Alex, because um, uh, Gonzalo Lira, who died um, at the end of last year in a Ukrainian prison, he was a um, Chilean-born U- US citizen who happened to be living in Kharkiv um, at the time of the at the time of the invasion, and was very, very, very critical of Zelensky and was quite clearly very pro-Russian. Um, yeah. very pro-war and he was thro- harassed by the SBU was under house arrest uh, purportedly and then was thrown in a Ukrainian jail he was released in order to stand trial again um, and he attempted to escape the country and he did so uh, like live streaming his attempted escape um, yeah. and he got picked up while trying to enter neighbouring Hungary um, and he claimed to have been tortured in prison by, and, and extorted uh, by, by by authorities and then very quietly at the end of last year he died from health complications yeah well I mean so long story short I uh, have disagreed I had disagreed with Gonzalo yes. on a huge number of topics um, however it's it's not controversial to say that he had a massive following and was very popular yeah um, shortly after he was detained uh his father, who is in his 80s, reached out to me and asked me to cover the detention. Yeah. Um, I felt personally uh, <coughs> responsible for, for doing that. You have some 80-year-old man um, who has not had a great relationship with his son over the years. Mm. It was something like 20 years that they had not spoken. But he, you know, obviously the paternal instincts kick in and you want to do everything you can to help your child. Yeah. Um, so I, I worked with him and I talked with him. Very, very sweet man. I, I, really, um, I really like the guy. Yeah. Um, A very big fan of you as well. The- big, big fan of mine. Um, I was able to not only interview him for the Gray Zone, but set him up with uh, some other media outlets, which uh, I'm not going to name. Um, but I, 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 I passed his contact around. Yeah. Um, so he he had been you know petitioning the State Department repeatedly for checks on his son Gonzalo, um, and getting pretty much no answer. Uh, the State Department would say, "Oh well, we had held a video call. He's got a public defender. We're you know we're doing everything we can." Um, I received a note uh, f- that was sent to me by his father, written by Gonzalo himself. Um, explaining that he had been having health issues and he was being basically left to die. Of neglect. Um, Of of neglect. So he had some health complications. Um, There's really no reason. People say, oh, well, he was a smoker, but... And, and he was in his 50s. There's really no reason a 50-year-old man should die of double yeah. pneumonia yeah. Um, in, in a prison unless they are being neglected. Um, yeah. So I, I published that handwritten note. Um, and, you know, I thought it was just very sick that yeah. uh, the Western media refused to uh, co- cover his death. I mean, um, the first uh, outlet to report on Gonzalo's death apart from the gray zone, uh, was uh, TASS, a Russian news yeah. agency. Um, it got virtually zero coverage in Western media. Yeah. Um, Western media was more than happy to let this American citizen die in Zelensky's prison um, and brush it under the rug uh, because it, it painted such a... The story, the facts of the story painted such a negative view yeah. of, um, of, of the... Of the uh, what what I am now referring to as the interim Zelensky presidency. Yeah. Um, well, it's like I mean I think as well that like um, Sarah or is it S uh, like Ashton Cirillo who is this yeah. rather bizarre um, 
uh, in, in, individual who has a history of making very, very uh, was the the official spokesperson of the Ukrainian armed forces at one stage. I believe so, yeah, <laughs> yeah I, I, and um, has a very very strange history. Um, claims to be trans, although clearly isn't enjoying it very much because they're not getting laid. Um, uh, like, has uh, she was she or he was 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 cheering the death of Gonzalo Lira and talking about how he was a threat to Ukraine's national security. And I think that they specifically cited the fact that he had shared f photos and videos of of U Ukrainians uh, warmly greeting. Uh, the, the the advancing Russians yeah. as an example of of his disinformation. Well, that, and, and that's the thing, and that's what the <clears throat> Ukrainian SBU uh, claimed he did was that he shared Ukrainian troop movements. Um, you see this? Are you running away? You, you, right, <laughs> and you see this all the time on social media. People saying, "Well, he he wasn't in prison for freedom of for his speech. He was yeah. in prison for breaking the law, i.e., sharing Ukrainian troop movements." Nobody ever links to that. Yeah. Nobody ever Except cites their source where yeah. what what exactly. Uh, this offense was so i mean it's very clear that uh he he was in fact a target for his speech so i mean whether i agree with this speech or not it doesn't matter a u.s ally allowed for and in fact probably um encouraged the death of an american citizen in their prison cell and mm. i you know i i mm. am uh quite fearful uh of of uh, Mr. Bogdan here's um, fate, yeah. and I encourage our followers to uh, raise hell again. Kit will be producing a report on on this gentleman. Yeah, yeah. Hopefully next week. On the subject of Ukraine, on the further subject of uh, of Ukraine, um, we have had some movement in the uh, in the in in the proxy war. Um, Alex has been on the in in the trenches on the proverbial front line of this uh, as ever. Um, so thank you, sir. Yeah, uh, it, there has been a profusion of people, um, uh, U.S. officials, recently. Well, yeah. Have... Okay. Do you want me to take it away? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, you guys may have seen we were able to obtain through some wizardry yes. uh, video, exclusive video of um, of former U.K. Prime Minister and, as Kit calls him, uh, walking unkempt bin bag full of yogurt, yes. Boris Johnson, uh, meeting with the Azov Battalion, praising them for their heroism, and but hey, 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 we've got to be clear here. It's the Azov Regiment. Yeah, no, because, no, like, it's brigade. We, yeah, no, because oh, yeah. because this is this is something to point out is that in the manner of these things, when um, Alex slash active measures broke this this huge story which is i mean it's got an incredible amount of pickup and i noticed a large number of uh telegram channels and media outlets have um stolen our exclusive clip yeah. and have slapped in some cases their own watermark on an already watermarked video uh, but yeah but, I, I i found i i have a screenshot that i saved where it's got our logo another logo uh and then two different uh sets of text super and yeah over yeah it. it's quite so four, it's passed through four different sets of hands oh, at yeah. least. but it's just like i mean i i mean i did i did i did like there was there, there was one media outlet which specifically said courtesy of our active measures and i i, I like i did like that I yeah like i mean that. when you say courtesy or give us a hyperlink yeah. for our exclusive that's yeah. that's more than acceptable but yeah so i think that the, there was a huge pylon from ukrainian ultras online and they were saying like, it's not a battalion it's a regiment yeah, as right. if this somehow undermines the fact that they have this absolutely shocking history of calling for an all-white europe and yeah. um and openly state that their war on russia that their hatred of russia and russians is inspired by the fact that the russian government is jewish and yeah. putin is a jew which is a untrue but b is the classic um <clears throat> And this is what Hitler was saying: was that you know behind every Bolshevik there's a Jew, and that like it's the the Soviet Union is a Jewish conspiracy. Um, yeah. So right. uh, the, yeah, and and Alex has done over the years has just done like uh, groundbreaking work, like digging into as of regiment or battalion um, and their connections and their yeah. and their their activities. Excuse me, we identify as a regiment now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Sorry, how how dare we presume um, like. Uh, what was it? What was that quote about, like rainbow flags and Maidan? Oh was yeah, that was that was Yevon Kadas, C fourteen. But um, let let me play the Bojo video, yeah, and then I want to talk. Uh, then I, then I want to address uh, 
this um, idea that uh, the Azov Battalion Regiment Brigade has been reformed. Yes. My pronouns, Regiment Brigade. <laughs> Thank you to uh, um, the heroes from the Azov Brigade who have honored us with their, their presence tonight. Give the Ukrainians what they need. Give them the weapons. Give them the authorization to use those weapons outside their own borders if they It's now absolutely ludicrous that Ukrainians should be forbidden from doing what Putin uh, is doing himself and uh, attacking Ukrainian forces. Why on earth should Ukrainian? Ukrainians be able uh, to attack Russian forces mustering on their borders. Give them those weapons, give them the attack weapons, give them the budget, give them the air defenses that they need. It's the single best investment that we can make in the defense of the whole Euro-Atlantic area is supporting Ukrainian heroes. We rely wholly on heroes such as the people who are here tonight with us from the Azov Brigade. So, we rely wholly on the heroes, such as the people that are with us tonight from the Azov Brigade. Yeah. Um, in case there was any question of whether this was a proxy war led by neo-Nazis. Yeah. And he did the classic thing of stating that this is like a great investment for us because the Ukrainians do all the dying yeah. in, right. in our, in our civilizational war, war against Russia. So, <coughs> I wanted to address this idea that the Azov brigade has been reformed um i did a report for the gray zone uh a while back um when vladimir zelensky interim president of ukraine uh met with andrei Boletsky, the founder of the azov battalion um and a key thing here that i pointed out and i don't think that this has gotten much pickup uh, we're, we're gonna we're gonna reproduce this again because yeah. it's uh, it's really important. But we have we have this new unit. It's called the Third Separate Assault Brigade. Uh, Zelensky praised them as quote excellent fighters. Um, this is Azov rebranded, right? Yes. It's led by Beletsky. Um, so you know the line, and this is what the ADL told me. Uh, in a uh, email that they sent to my inquiries, um, basically excusing the Azov and claiming that they're, they're reformed, no longer neo-Nazis, as they once called them. Mm. Um, they said that Bilecki is no longer a part of the Azov battalion, and in fact, he's now only the leader of the National Corps, which is the political party associated with the Azov, and that these entities are separate. Well, actually, they're separated by an office divider because they share an office in Kiev. <laughs> Um, they share headquarters. Um, so the Azov Brigade, uh, Azov on Telegram, I believe, today we officially announced that the SSO Azov is expanding to a brigade. From now on, we are the third separate assault brigade of the ground forces of the Ukrainian armed forces. So, and this is the photo that they publicized that announcement with, wherein they are uh, performing fascist salutes. Um, so, you know, in this article, I, I, I go over some of the history of Andrei Belitsky, who founded, before the Azov Brigade, uh, an organization called the Patriots of Ukraine. This was um, following his participation in a Ukrainian outfit called, uh, what was it, the Social National, National Party. <laughs> You know, not to be confused with the yeah. National Socialist Party. Yeah. Um, it's, not a, it's not a pyramid scheme. It's a circle scheme. Right, like, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, some of our viewers have, have, have uh, latched onto that. Really? It's, yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. Um, so he was uh, involved with the uh, Patriot of Ukraine Party. And Patriot of Ukraine, according to the Kharkov Human Rights Protection Group, uh, espoused xenophobic and neo-Nazi ideas and was engaged in violent attacks against migrants, foreign students in Kharkiv, and those opposing its views. What's more, Belitsky and some other members were suspected of violent seizures of newspaper kiosks and similar criminal activities. Uh, for three years running, the organization has gained notoriety for its torch processions around student campuses in Kharkov, Kiev, Chernet Chernovitsky, uh, which fill foreign students studying in Ukraine with terror. So, I mean, that sounds to me uh, like pretty much what I saw in Charlottesville, um, Virginia, uh, when uh, many leftists 
were hmm. permanently injured, mutilated, killed. Uh, one was killed um, by uh, by groups which have had associations and trainings from the Azov Battalion. <laughs> um, during a Patriots of Ukraine meeting in 2009, Bilecki raved, how can we describe our enemy, the authorities and the oligarchs? Do they have anything in common? Yes, they have one thing in common. They are Jews, or behind them, they're real masters, Jews. <laughs> it's, revenge it, is the best form of revenge. Uh, they, they, yeah. they, they, I mean, it's just, but it's just quite remarkable as well that like this, of course, get got like zero pick. Well, I do think that like websites like Pink News, which is this UK-based kind of LGBTQ uh, publication, um, they did they did some really great work on um, on how like y Ukrainian neo-Nazi groups, which are again not representative of Ukrainian what society more widely, and this is one of the reasons why. Um, uh, the, the, <clears throat> Uh, people are dodging the draft on top of them, the fact they don't want to die under this hail of of, Ru of russian artillery is that they're just they're, they're not up for war the neo-nazis were yeah which is the the point and it's like that yeah that they would do things like uh, go to d d d descend on mass in large groups and attack like gay nightclubs and you're armed with like pepper spray knives um, knuckle dusters and stuff but like when there was a, a much publicized uh, pride parade in you in uh, in Kiev a few years back I think it was 2019 and like they like caught people with like RPGs who were trying to to send on on, on like on a pride parade and it's just like yeah I mean this is this is the reality yeah these people are really 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 dangerous um, I also have from Beletsky this is uh, some of the um writings that were published of his under yeah. the title uh, words of a white leader of the white leader yeah. um this was uh published while he was in prison for ordering the murder of a member of another member of patriot yes. of ukraine um and we have uh we have uh, this is in Cyrillic. I haven't translated this one. This, Lazy. this document. Lazy. Um, yeah. But uh, <laughs> um. so here we have uh, for three. Okay, no, I'm sorry. Um, in one of these essays, uh, one essay in the collection dated 2007 rails against Jews and black migrants, casually dropping the N word in the process. Ukraine is the light of Europe. Our nation still has enough strength to withstand the influx of foreigners to cleanse our land and light the fire of purification throughout Europe. Another essay outlines the democratically. Idea. Democratically. Uh, no, yeah, no, like, yeah. Yeah. Um, another essay outlines the ideology of social nationalism. Uh, in that essay, Beletsky praises national socialism as a great idea, but criticized the Nazis as having been been insufficiently eugenicist in their family welfare programs. He explained that they support that they supported parents with multiple children, quote, without consideration for the biological quality of each individual family. The result, he continued, was a significant increase in the birth rate, but a significant decrease in the percentage of Nordic type in the population. He, uh, because these social benefits are aimed at the masses, they encourage the worst human material to give birth to the first uh, to a child in the first place. Um, another uh, manifesto by Valetsky, language and race primary issues, expanded on the social nationalist concept. Ukrainian social nationalism considers the Ukrainian nation to be a blood racial community. Race is everything for a nation building. Race is the basis on which the superstructure grows in the form of national culture, which again comes from the racial nature of the people and not from language, religion, and economy. Uh, so, I mean, you, you, you guys get the idea here. This is a hardcore neo-Nazi. He's got a very long history of, uh, of sharing quotes. It's not, you know, people use the, um, uh, his quote about leading the white races of the world in the final crusade against the semi-led Untermenschen. Um, there's, there's a lot more than that. Yeah, and, it's, um, and I, I, I think that it's, it's like, again, in, it, 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 you get these kind of lame quote unquote fact checkers or anti fake news people yeah. who are just like, well, Blitz, Beletsky says he never said that. And it's like, well, even if he didn't, yeah, like, but here, his, I his mean, PH, like, his, yeah. his PhD thesis, uh, like, his just, PhD uh, thesis was on Stepan Bandera and the yes. organization. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's, responsible for killing uh, over 100,000 Jews, Poles, yeah. uh, communists. And then what happened? Was it 2017, Alex? What was that? Na there was a, rena a certain renaming of a. 
of a street in Kiev. Oh, yeah, and, and, and of course, yeah, I mean, well, ever since the Maidan color revolution, uh, mm. there's been a, uh, uh, I mean, there was, they took away the, the uh, under Yanukovych, they took away the um, Hero of Ukraine Award from Stepan Bandera. They gave it back. They renamed uh, the main street leading to Baban Yar, which is the site of the massacre of over 100,000 um, to Stepan Bandera Avenue. Yeah. Um, they, they've just like all, all across the country uh, venerated um, yeah. this, this mass murderer and Nazi collaborator. Yeah. And, um, it's like, I and think they continue the, to. Yeah, and it's like, I think on the point of assimilation as well is that like, <clears throat> when he, when he, 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 yeah, the, um, the 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 to, the total Ukrainianization of of of, you, of the kind of Russian speaking regions is that the, the, these were areas which had a large amount of Lenin statues, yeah. and they were replaced with statues of Stepan Bandera. Yeah. It was quite clear what they were doing, um, and, and it is it is un, and again, this is not representative of the wider population. No. It is a very select and dangerous minority yeah um <clears throat> well i mean so I, and that's the thing you know you have a lot of people who have pointed out over the years that um during national elections mm. uh the coalition of of neo-nazis uh received something like three percent of yeah. the vote yeah. um fine true uh, however, local elections in certain places like Lvov, yeah. uh, they received they much more, better. much yeah. more. And, 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 and that doesn't speak to the issue of, of, of uh, neo-Nazi sympathies at the highest level of government. Yeah. Neo-Nazi sympathies within the military, I those mean, aren't elected you, I mean, positions. to use an analogy as well, is that like, I think that it, it's a real red herring to, in, terms of, in terms of societal and political influence. It's like, it, you look at the UK, well, like, N Nigel Farage, or like Nigel Farage, who is this kind of long uh, he, he was behind the referendum on the UK leaving the EU yeah. basically he's been a hugely influential force or I mean or at least was for like most of the most of the the, the past decade um, he's he, he's been massively influential and impactful um, he's never held office yeah apart he was elected to the European Parliament and that's it yeah. and it's like uh, yeah so I think that and it, it, it is overstated I think it's also important to bear in mind as well that these are the people that the, the West was supporting and this was the case in Stepan Bandera worked for MI6 at a time when the CIA was saying this guy's fucking cra crackers and yeah. even the CIA he was too extreme for the CIA and then the MI, MI6 which is Britain's foreign intelligence service thought he was brilliant yeah. and they continued to uh, sponsor the growth of nationalism very specifically because it, it is concerned with turning the population against Russians, um, <laughs> the, uh, and, uh, or or at the very least breaking away countries from Russia's orbit. Yeah. And whether we think that that's a good, a good or a bad thing is kind of moot. It's like you know, that is what the, the purpose. Um, so yeah, and and it was a, it was during that that demonic um, praise of uh, of Azov by former Prime Minister Mister bin bag full of rubbish that he stated it was ludicrous that ukraine was not allowed to strike targets inside russia um we know from my reporting uh that uh the it was uh british military intelligence operatives who were behind the strike on on kirch bridge on putin's birthday in 2022 uh, and this was despite u.s opposition to doing it yeah uh, so what, what what have you got here, Alex? So we have uh, some updates. This in the past week, uh, Ukrainian strike on uh, Russia's strategic early warning radar uh, is a big deal, according to the war zone. This has been re this is like I, I'm not really familiar with the war zone, but I've seen actually this the same article no. uh, republished in outlets like Yahoo News. So they clearly are some kind of uh, military minded wire service. Um, and we have some some important quotes from this. Uh, satellite imagery confirms a Russian strategic early warning radar site in the southwestern end of the country was substantially damaged in a reported Ukrainian drone attack earlier this week. This looks to be the first of its kind attack on a site linked to Russia's general strategic defense. As such, it points to a new and worrisome dimension to the conflict, especially when it comes to the potential use of nuclear weapons. The two uh, Vorozen DMs at the facility are a key part of Russia's larger strategic early warning network, and their loss, even temporarily, could only degrade the country's ability to detect incoming nuclear threats. There are also concerns about how this could impact the ability of Russia's overall strategic warning network 
to evaluate potential threats and eliminate false positives due to a possible loss of overlapping coverage in certain areas. Beyond that, it has been pointed out that the, the attack on Arm Armavir could meet the conditions for the Russian government laid out publicly in 2020 for actions that could trigger a nuclear retaliatory strike. Russia's warning network is part of the country's broader nuclear deterrent posture. So we have an attack which, according to the Russian rule book, could provoke a nuclear strike. Yeah. Um, we have... But this, this is, this is, there's a wider point to make as well, which yeah. is that like every single time, and this has been throughout the, <clears throat> the conflict, we have been told, well, there, there are, Ukraine ultras have said, and indeed as has British intelligence, uh, an oxymoron, um, that Russia won't escalate and it's all, it's all for show and yeah. whatnot. And it's like, the, the, they point to the fact, they point to the fact, well, we've done this, this and this, and they haven't nuked us. And what they, what, what they're, they're missing out this really important word, which is yet. Yeah. I, 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 and this is the thing is as 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 lunatic and, and idiotic as the US Imperial Brain Trust can be sometimes um it, it, there is enough like relatively sober rational people to understand that this is that this is a prospect yeah right and it's like and, and that they are very wary of it coming to this now I, I was one of a large number of people who for many years thought that right that, that that russia would not was not going to um invade ukraine because because they were doggedly committed to minsk which yeah. is the uh now what a lot of what why this war caught a lot of people off guard was because they understood that Russia was committed to trying to end this diplomatically, and there are there are even reports by like Soros-funded organisations like the International Crisis Group, which explicitly state that Russia is trying to sort this out diplomatically. Again, people kind of forgot that war is the continuation of politics via other means. So when diplomacy breaks down, um, and it was became abundantly clear that the Ukrainians were not going to implement Minsk despite promises. Well, the next step is war, and then the first two months of this conflict, which were which were almost a, a limited military policing operation in many ways. It wasn't the shock and awe of of, uh, of, of the Iraq invasion. Um, that it was concerned with getting Ukraine to negotiate and push them to the negotiating table and ratcheting up the intensity of the the, the violence until they did this. Um, the Ukrainian forces were basically routed by by April, and this is when there are the, there are draft peace agreements which are, are finally being circulated, and they they continue having all of these meetings in Turkey and Belarus and and and, and talks on Zoom, and it's sabotaged by Boris Johnson. Yeah. And now, and now, fast forward to today. Boris Johnson is at the forefront of pushing for conscription in the UK for, for war with Russia, and is also praising Azov Battalion and inviting them to Parliament. I mean, yeah, it, 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 yeah. it's interesting how these things. Well, work, and also it? in that video, we had uh, uh, Ben Wallace, hmm. the former UK Defence Minister, just oh, yeah. kind of standing around, I'm looking not, looking a bit embarrassed. Oh, he's. I mean, he's a, he's a total Ukraine ultra, and it's like yeah. kind of being an armchair general from the sidelines. And sure. Like, I mean, I think it was he was the he he was one of those voices who, for most of the absolutely disastrous counteroffensive, where Ukraine Ukraine was driving supposedly indestructible Western tanks into massive Russian minefields and then just getting blown apart and, yeah. like, and resulted in maybe between a hundred to one hundred and fifty thousand a thousand people dead or mutilated for life. Yeah. Uh, to re to regain a quarter of a percentage point of the land lost to Russia. Um, he was the one on the sidelines saying, "Well, it's it's getting better, and like you know, they're closing in on Crimea, and like actually, just to just to push them over that 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 line, we should actually start conscripting what remains of Ukraine's younger male population, like really pushing yeah. for this." And then it's like, "Well, <laughs> you know." So, continuing on with the strikes yeah. inside Russia, the push for it. Um, Inside the White House, a debate over letting Ukraine shoot U.S. weapons into Russia. After a sobering trip to Kiev, Secretary of State Antony Blinken is urging the president to lift restrictions on how Ukraine can use American weapons. I love how they describe the trip to Kiev as sobering. He went to a Nazi-themed pizza parlor. And then played a satirical... Neil Young song. Yeah, about yeah. about imperialism. <laughs> about imp with it's about imperialism, about living in the free world. Yeah. Um. I mean, that's like, 
it's going to be an Adam Curtis documentary set to like you know kind of grinding industrial music like I think in in, in future um but but yeah like I mean yeah a sobering a sobering trip where they are I mean the the, the distance between Kiev and the front line is like it spans several European countries it's like yeah. vast yeah. miles away yeah like since the first American shipments of sophisticated weapons to Ukraine, President Biden has never wavered on one prohibition. President Vladimir Zelensky has agreed to never fire them into Russian territory, insisting that would violate Mr. Biden's mandate to avoid World War III. But the consensus around that policy is fraying. Propelled by the State Department, there is now a vigorous debate inside the administration over relaxing the ban to allow Ukrainians to hit missiles and artillery launch sites just over the border in Russia. Targets that Mr. Zelensky say, says have enabled Moscow's recent territorial gains. The proposal, pressed by Secretary of State Anthony Blinken after a sobering visit to, Ukraine, to Kiev last week, is in its formative stages and it is not clear how many colleagues among Mr. Biden's inner circles have signed on. But officials involved in the deliberations said Mr. Blinken's position had changed because the Russians had opened a new front in the war with devastating results. So, I mean, what does that mean? That means that they that that the that the loss of Kharkov was so catastrophic mm -hmm. that they're now willing to push this this to, to prod mm. against Putin's red line, mm. which is the use of foreign weapons yeah. in in Russian territory. Yeah. Um, there is some reporting that I've done uh, a, a while back about how this most likely already happened. There were a number of uh, drone attacks um, yeah. when Ukraine was doing the Army <clears throat> of Drones uh, charm offensive, uh, yeah. raising money for um, very cheap drones, uh, basically strapped with C4, as we've discussed in the past yeah. um and some of those it looks like they were american made yeah. um so this has kind of already happened but th we're talking about something very different here we're talking about missile strikes like on 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 russian cities yeah. and I, I might add as well that like the timing of this is completely idiotic because it, it, the um zelensky's term as president elapsed on the 20th of may Ch china sorry russia has made a huge uh, has, has made much of this. It hasn't really been mentioned in the in the Western media, but they have talked. They are now talking about how legally he is the illegitimate, um, le like leader, and that he is you know, head heading up a um, a military hunter, and they will not be negotiating with him because he is illegitimate. He's also on their wanted list, of course. So, <clears throat> by calling for strikes on Russian cities now, yeah. Um, uh, Russian strikes on the presidential palace, uh, pr yeah. uh, possi certainly possible. Yeah. Um, and I think that again, the operative term is yet. And but, I mean, again, r r r r r Russian officials have also used this phraseology that like we haven't even started yet in terms yeah. of the special military operation, quote unquote. So um, it could turn into a an actual war. Um, from Russia's perspective, with all that implies, and you know, we have the the horrific images of of Gaza um, and, and the, the the flattening of of, of civilian political um, in, in, you know, and otherwise infrastructure. Uh, we 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 could, and I really hope this doesn't happen, see similar scenes in yeah. Kiev. That has been an option since the very start of this. Yeah. Um, so, in, um, in <laughs> fact, I'm more surprised than anything that it hasn't happened yeah. yet. Well, it's. I mean, there um, are there are U.S. there are nameless U.S. Officials, I think they were quoted. I think it was the end of 2022, where they said that um, uh, uh, the, the Russia's light touch approach to this had baffled them. Yeah, they are like deliberately fighting with one arm tied behind their back in terms of what they are and aren't striking. Um, they have, have, have purely gone for military targets and. It, the, 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 one of the reasons that this is rather missed is because Ukraine keeps stationing uh, military personnel and ammunition and weapons in civilian infrastructure. Yeah. So not only is that an attempt to conceal it, it's a war crime as well. Yeah. But the um, so it's illegal under the Geneva, Geneva Convention. But but when this happens. They can claim, oh, Russia deliberately bombed a car park for no reason, yeah. and 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 then the, the the footage which contains very clear audio of like secondary explosions yeah. um, is muted, yeah, so people don't hear it. Right. So it's like they, the Ukraine gets like a, a a major propaganda win out of this. Yeah. So I just want to read this one last paragraph from it. the New York Times article. The pressure is mounting on the United States to help Ukraine target Russian military sites, even if Washington 
wants to maintain its ban on attacking oil refineries and other Russian infrastructure with American-provided arms. Britain, usually in lockstep with Washington on war strategy, has quietly lifted its own restrictions so that, quote, storm shadow cruise, cruise systems can be used to target Russia more broadly. So we have David Cameron, um, yes. who has called for strikes on Russia with British weapons. Yes. Kiev can now, this is the article I have up, Kiev can now use British weapons inside Russia, Cameron. Uh, we have the Boris Johnson video I played where he's calling for it. We have Blinken calling for it, pushing Biden to do so. It says a lot when Joe Biden is the cool head and, yeah. and the, the barrier to preventing further escalation. Victoria Nuland, who le- recently left the administration um, and I think generally considered uh, on on the hawkish side oh, yes. of uh, of um, foreign policy, American foreign policy, calling for strikes um, yeah. in this in this video from ABC News. I think it's I mean, time to help. The headline being, it's, it is time to help Ukraine hit bases in Russia, Victoria Newland. Uh, and we, then, I mean, this is of course doing tons to uh, win hearts and minds in the, amongst the Russian population. Yeah, as well, um, and uh, yeah. <laughs> And we have finally. I'm gonna play. Um, I'm gonna play a little bit of Stoltenberg here. Go for it. Has come for allies to consider whether they should lift some of the restrictions they have put on um, the use of weapons they have donated to uh, to Ukraine, uh, because uh, especially now when a lot of the fighting is going on in Kharkiv, close to the border. Uh, to deny uh, Ukraine the possibility of using these weapons against legitimate military targets uh, on Russian territory makes it very hard for them to defend themselves. So to be clear, you're asking the US to lift the restrictions on the use of American weapons over Russian territory? I believe the time has come for allies to uh, consider whether they should lift uh, some of the restrictions they have imposed uh, on uh, weapons donated to Ukraine. Um, because we need to remember what this is. This is a, a war of aggression by Russia against Ukraine. Ukraine has the right to defend themselves, and that includes also uh, striking targets on Russian territory. Um, some allies have already lifted those uh, restrictions, uh, allowing uh, to use their weapons against military targets in Ukraine, and I believe the time has come for all the allies to uh, so, so continue this. The UK has effectively lifted the restrictions, and it is the US that's really the single most important one. I think what we see now uh, demonstrates the need to reconsider those uh, restrictions, not least because we have fighting going on along the uh, border between So we have very much in a obvious move uh, escal- escalating because of the loss of Kharkiv and the inability of Ukraine to defend that city. Um, the the growing potential for a situation which could lead to World War III. Uh, Maria Zarahova, the spokeswoman for the uh, Russian Foreign Ministry, mm. uh, has said explicitly that if UK weapons are used to attack Russia inside Russian territory, then they will strike UK targets. So yeah. very dangerous situation. I mean, I, th- I think as and I think as well that the the entire the entire purpose of this, from Britain's perspective, is to get the US all in. Yep. on the war i mean with what given the problems that the us is facing um trying to uh deter the houthis um god's partisans and Sarala from um uh their red sea blockade um it, 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 I, i'm not certain but it's like as i've reported on for the gray zone there are a number of mili- British military intelligence officials who uh, uh, openly talk in their private discussions about the need to counter at once US hesitancy. And it's been even been reported in, by the BBC that behind closed doors, the, U- the UK is applying pressure to the, to the US to um, escalate this. Um, and they, they, yeah, they are, they are uh, opposed to Biden's hesitancy. Now, one of these officials, one of these um, officials used to run an organization called uh, the Institute for Statecraft, which is basically an MI6 NATO front, um, a, a, a think tank. Um, and on their website 10 years ago, they published um, an essay that was calling for anti-subversive measures against Russia, such as diplomatic encir- encirclement, black propaganda, um, which would lead to a war of the old-fashioned sort that Great Britain and the West will win. 
Um, and we are watching the failure of that project unfold now. Yeah. And their only option is to get the US involved what, you know, by hook or by crook one way or another. Yeah. Um, so we shall, we shall see whether this bears fruit. It doesn't really bear thinking about, of course. Um, and on that subject, if there are ominous signs um, in my country of birth that, uh, yeah, that the, the, the government is preparing for war now. So if we draw up the, the, yeah, the, cons the, the Conservative government, um, their campaign so far. So um, Rishi Sunak has just as a bit of background called an early election. He didn't need to uh, because by law it would be in December this year. Um, anyway, that's five years after the last election which the Conservatives won by a, by a landslide, very, very sadly. Um, and uh, their, their campaign's been uh, a real disaster so far with, um, from, from the word go, like Sunak announced this while being rained on with no one holding an umbrella for him, despite, and despite the fact that there is a very expensive briefing room in Downing Street, which was made for announcements like this. Yeah. Um, so, so yeah, he's been much mocked. Um, Part of me thinks that he's deliberately trying to lose this as badly as he can. Um, they have announced plans to to bring back mandatory national service, which is conscription. Um, and I might add that the UK is the only country, and nobody knows this, but they're the only country in Europe that conscripts child soldiers. You can join the army when you're under 18. Is that right? Yeah, yeah. and it's like there's a lot of attempts and, to... And, and, and Ukraine. Oh, true. Actually, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I think yeah. it's sixteen now. They yeah, just lower all hands, it, so. all hands to the pump. I think. Right. It's like yeah, that that that, um, uh, and Britain does a lot to try and promote uh, the military in schools. Um, there's yeah. something called combined cadet force where children get to get the uh, the thrilling experience. I.e., have to dress up in military. Um, kind of khaki fatigues and learn how to march and follow orders um which might i thought they teach you that at like elementary school yeah 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 which is like which is like kind of trying yeah like exactly which is like trying to drill into children this kind of nap this yeah, militarist yeah. mindset um it might be why recruitment numbers are so bad in the uk that like it, it, it's at like record lows i think it's only like they've only got like seventy thousand active soldiers and they are thinking about relaxing entry requirements to allow asthmatics and people with very severe, severe mental and physical health problems it's what could possibly go wrong but like the um well i i recently heard a story from a personal relationship that i have secondhand yes. of a uh somebody in their mid-30s being led into the u.s army who had a previous uh arrest uh, related to possession of methamphetamines, so yeah, <laughs> I mean this, this that just speaks to you know how yeah. how bad things are oh, in yeah. terms of recruitment on, well, in like, the U.S. as well. Yeah, but it's like I mean I think that the yeah that the, the, a, a lot a lot yeah a, a, people have nothing to fight for and they don't want to die in a a senseless war. However. Um, they, another, on top of trying to bring back national service, which would, would five years ago have been unthinkable in the UK, there was this rather spooky Scottish Nationalist Party MP called Stuart MacDonald, who um, uh, it, during the pandemic proposed something called national resilience, which would see young people um, be, uh, the, the, while at school, uh, be trained to be... Um, uh, uh, military or police or healthcare, emer kind of emergency workers in the case of a disaster. But it's not national service, it's national resilience. It's complete, again, it's not a pyramid yeah. scheme, it's a circle scheme. And so um, that was shouted down and and very much criticised throughout across the political spectrum. And it's yeah. just like, this is completely insane. Like, what are you proposing? And then now here we are five years, well, four years later. But yeah, um, there is a another worrying sign that the UK is, is preparing for war, in my opinion, which is that there, there has been a huge, after Sunak announced the election, um, there's been a vast number of MPs who've, who have announced they are standing down and won't be seeking re-election. Now, this usually happens, but it's, it's, it's usually like a handful yeah. Of, of you know like you can count genuinely count on one hand the number of people there are almost 80 conservative MPs the, the parliamentarians from the ruling political party including serving government ministers and very people like Michael Gove who was a very 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 prominent and I think he's been a, a cabinet minister since uh, 2010 
um, which is quite rare. Like it's very rare for people to hang on that long. Mm. Um, and it's like 14 years he's been a government minister and has been at the kind of forefront of a lot of uh, uh, various conservative policy initiatives. And um, he has announced that he is going to going to stand down and he's in a very, very, very safe seat where he could expect to be re-elected. So I don't think this exodus is purely because the conservatives based on current polls are going to get hammered. Um, I do think that there is an element of wanting to head off uh, people running as independents after the success of George Galloway. And I gather that, that, that Craig Murray, the former British ambassador to Kazakhstan, who's turned into a whistleblower and journalist, uh, very critical of Western power, um, he's running in Blackburn. Um, you know, I, I, Active Measures wishes him the absolute best of luck. Uh, there are a few other um, independent um, uh, figures who have announced their candidacy for various seats. So that, 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 that's an aspect of calling it early that they want to head it off. But calling it so early and indeed, yeah, like 80 MPs standing down. What do they know that's coming? Yeah. What that's do they not really want to be associated that's with? That's really worrying. Yeah. So, um, yeah, God help us all. Yeah. If you're in the UK and you're, you're of fighting age, you very well could be soon dying for interim president Vladimir Zelensky or... BlackRock. Benjamin, or Benj BlackRock, Benjamin Netanyahu. Yeah. Um, I think I think that's it for our stories, yeah. except for we have uh, what will follow an interview uh, that Kit conducted with Nabosha Malich, a friend of the show. Um, Kit, do you want to explain? And yeah. then we'll just we'll just roll in, and you guys can stick around for that. Yeah, sure. So um, no, Neb's a uh, uh, yeah a friend friend of the show, like lo like long time. Um, ju like journalist, um, obituarist of the U.S. empire, um, and a, 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 a contrarian voice on the um, the U U.S. proxy wars in in Yugoslavia during the 1990s. Uh, there have been some major geopolitical developments related to a very specific event in the Yugoslav wars, known as the Srebrenica genocide, um, and uh, it, the UN has just voted to recognise um, July 11th as an annual. Um, uh, Srebrenica commem genocide commemoration day. Um, he has a very uh, interesting and insightful take on why this has happened and its geopolitical significance, and also more generally the the, um, uh, the, the what actually occurred during the uh, the Bosnian War, where he in that time as a, as a teenage Serb living in Sarajevo, he was very much literally on the front line. So. Yeah. Yeah, and, not, uh, not one to miss. Uh, just just before I play, I play the clip. Uh, thank you to our viewers. Sorry about the interruption to the broadcast. Yeah. Um, we're gonna have uh, more video. <laughs> we'll have more. <laughs> this is why I called you UK heavyweight. Champion. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, right. We'll have <laughs> the frequent beatings. I'm, 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 on, I'm on the receiving end of. Um, we're, we'll have more interview uh, videos, uh, investigations coming throughout the week. They will uh, continue until morale improves. Right. Um, yeah. <laughs> Uh, we're so overwhelmed with the support that you guys have been giving us uh, and just like a personal thanks to yeah. each and every one of you. Yeah, th no, thank you. It really does mean everything. So God bless you for that, guys. Cheers. On May 23rd, a majority of UN member states voted to recognize July 11th as an international day of remembrance for the Srebrenica genocide. The, war, the civil war in Bosnia, uh, encouraged and facilitated at every step by the US, um, was a bitter, grinding three-year civil, civil conflict that pitted Bosniaks, Croats and Serbs, who'd previously been friends, neighbours and relatives, against one another in a hellish cycle of violence. Srebrenica remains a highly controversial and contested event, and the UN vote appears concerned with cementing the narrative that what happened there was a genocide. Nabozha Malic is a veteran documentarian of the Yugoslav wars of the 90s and uh, the, the collapse of the US empire. Um, he was kind enough to take some time to sit down with me and discuss the geopolitical significance uh, of the Srebrenica vote at the UN. Take a listen. The notorious Nabozha Malic. Um, it is an honour. Um, uh, yeah, so um, what's happening at the UN today? Well, the General Assembly got conned into voting for this resolution, ostensibly proposed by Rwanda and Germany, uh, the two countries that, whose names are sort of uh, symbolically Synony associated, synonymous, synonymous yes. with genocide. In fact, as the Russian ambassador noted very politely, uh, Germany has no right to take that word into its mouth because the UN was invented to prevent the German genocide, the Jews in World War II, and Serbs and Russians and others mm. from happening again. Um, but 
they basically, I mean, it's blatantly obvious that the resolution wasn't written by the Germans or the Rwandans, but they're no. the you know people who hired them for the purpose. Uh, and I'm looking at Washington and London for this. Hmm. Um, and you know they they essentially conned the General Assembly into saying, well, you you. You all think genocide is bad, right? So therefore, vote for this resolution to mm. confirm that you're nice and you hate genocide. And there was all of these, all of this. What was really shocking to me it was how many countries admitted that they knew exactly what was going on, mm. that they realized that this was all a scam and a ploy, and then they voted for it anyway. Primarily, Such as the UN. Um. <laughs> right. Well, you know, I wasn't really, I was pleasantly surprised by some of the majority Muslim countries mm. who said, well, we'll at least abstain from this because we see what's going on. Mm. But several that should have voted against or been, uh, or abstained out of decency chose not to. But in, in any case, this resolution has been, they've been pushing it for months. And in fact, it was, uh, Serbian President Vucic uh, revealed that they, the first proposal for it came two days, two days, 48 hours after the anniversary of the NATO war of 99. And he's like, I was in a security council. Coincidence. Right. I was objecting to this. And all of these Western governments are telling me, oh, well, that's the past. You need to look to the future. And then they turn around and look 29 <laughs> yeah. years in the past, which is a nice round number. No, wait, it isn't. Uh, and decide to go through with this now. Yeah, because they. I mean, I think that, that that's really shocking. I mean, and it's it, it's got zero um, media pickup whatsoever, of course. But like, yeah, that there was a planned UN, UN Security Council um, special meeting on uh, the bo the criminal uh, bombing of Yugoslavia uh, on the 25th anniversary. Um, the Serbian Prime Minister flew out specially, and then it got sabotaged. By France and and, and Britain, um, yeah. The, I mean, I, I, I was aware of some of the discussions that were being had, like around this. It was very difficult to get to 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 get agreement to have the meeting at all. Um, and this is despite the UN uh, agreeing, sorry, the UN Security Council agreeing to hearings on the false f flag chemical attack in Duma. Like it's it, it, you know it, it's really quite remarkable. So I mean, it also created this this vote in the UN also created a situation whereby um, Iran and Israel agreed for one time. Um, I, uh, can you expand like, on? Well, I mean, it's, it's a Serbian superpower. We can get all sorts of agreements to happen. Uh, <laughs> even if it's you know united in hating us or defending yes. us. <laughs> um, but. It's it's really not that mysterious. I actually um, literally made that argument myself. You know, Iran. And, there's, here's just here's something that both Iran and Israel can agree on. Yes. A month ago. Okay. And I spelled it out and I said, you know, the the, the issue with this is that if an alleged massacre of eight thousand people in a town mm -hmm. can be declared genocide, then anything can be declared genocide. Yes. And if you can get the uh, general assembly to vote one into existence with a simple majority of those present, which is what happened because they didn't get the majority of actual member states, uh, then, you know, who's next? Anybody's next. Anybody who's on the, on the naughty list of the powers that be, you know, to, and Israel certainly can't hope for a, a general assembly majority. I could imagine that there would be enough people in the General Assembly who might vote against, may, might be persuaded to vote against Iran mm. as well. In fact, I'm, I'm pretty sure that there's a decent majority in General Assembly that could be voting against the United States. And this is what people meant by Pandora's box. Once you've established a rule, a precedent, that you can conjure genocide into existence by having a, a, a simple majority of those present General Assembly resolution about it, then everything becomes a genocide. Indeed. And I, be, I believe the sponsors of this resolution are banking on other people not lawfaring them back. We'll see whether that's going to happen or not. <laughs> but in my opinion, looking at the uh, speeches by Russia and China during the session, I don't think they're joking. I don't, it's, it's no more Mr. Nice Guy from them anymore. I think they've seen this for what it is, and I think they're going to retaliate with lawfare just as well. Because you know, now that now that the rule has been established, they're going to use it. It's what I forget. I always forget which one of these uh, in the Alinsky rule set this is. But make the enemy live up to their, their own set of rules, 
And that's exactly what they're going to do. They're going to throw it right back at the globalist American empire, which, make no mistake, is behind this. Yeah, indeed. I mean, you say, you say alleged massacre in Srebrenica. Um, can you expand on that? Well, uh, I, I, I could really get bogged down in the weeds here, but it's one of those... <laughs> actually, technically, how many people were killed in Srebrenica itself? You ask that from the Hague Tribunal, and they will have to reluctantly and grudgingly admit zero. Uh, yeah, I don't know what narrative people have been fed and what they believe, but I was in Bosnia at the time. I was monitoring in real time, like media reports yeah. filtered through uh, for, from all sides. Uh, I, I even had access to UN briefings at the time, and there was no mention of anything happening in Potocari itself. The Dutch troops that were stationed there literally testified, we didn't see anything happen. Uh, you know, the women and children were, docu- you know, they were filmed getting onto these buses and driven to, transported to safety. So what ends up being this, the subject of this whole story is the 28th Division of the Army of the Republic of Bosnia-Herzegovina, which is predominantly Muslim, that decides to abandon their women and children and march to Tuzla through Serb-held territory, through minefields, through ravines, through ambush points, through artillery fire, which is composed of, like, it was 98 or 99 percent of combatants uh, in, in this column. And, you know, you, you would be hard-pressed to, obviously, it would be heartless to say they're a legitimate military target, but that's the legal definition of it. And so you have a case of people testifying, yes, we fought through, we got attacked by artillery, a lot of people died here and there. And then you have, um, I believe, the final amount of bodies they found that were tied up, mm. that, that had ligatures, right? yeah. uh, was something in the neighborhood of 500 altogether. So people who had been taken prisoner, and at that point, at some point, between being t- after being taken prisoner, executed, which is a war crime. And nobody's denying that. Uh, the Serbs, first of all, like, yep, yeah, this is a war crime, and some of our people did this. Because it is. But then you fast forward to the ICTY, the, the tribunal that was basically funded by the U.S. People say NATO, but it's the U.S. Yeah. that did the lion's share, just like NATO. Yeah. And you had their judges <clears throat> and prosecutors essentially conjure these ob- obscure tangential legal theories in which this is the only genocide in in the history of humanity that happened theoretically in one town that did not target non-combatants that there's no evidence of intent there's no direct evidence of an, evidence of an order right there's no order. Any command there, level. there's not a single person who ever who has ever tried for ordering it mm. All of the people involved were basically like, well, you should have known this was going to happen. Or uh, you were aiding and abetting it by not stopping it. And the defense was like, stopping what? You have to prove something was actually happening. Mm. And yet all of these trials were basically like, yeah, well, some people got killed somewhere and we don't know the exact number and you're to blame. Mm. I'm, I'm paraphrasing and I'm obviously painting with a very broad brush. Mm. But if you actually go through the ICTY records, you will find that they've never established a, a, the actual number of people killed, or who killed them, or where, or under what circumstances. It's one of those, you are asserting the existence of a crime, but you're not, docu- you're not proving it. Mm. And you've got a, a war crime, you've got the execution of prisoners you can prosecute people over, but no. you. The people behind this were determined to make it a genocide. Why? Because genocide is the the crime that invalidates one's existence. If you're guilty of genocide, you don't get to exist, right? That's that's how the the thinking goes. It it worked in Rwanda, right? You ask the current government and they'll tell you, yeah, uh, we're we're the survivors of genocide and our opposition is existing at our sufferance. I'm not justifying anything the Hutus did, I'm just saying try talking to a Hutu in Rwanda. My point being that the ICTY set out to make this a genocide at all costs and basically defined it, whatever facts they could stitch together, to fit 
redefine, change the definition to fit whatever facts they were able to prove, and that's not very many. And the, because, and this is what not, not a lot of people remember, from day one, almost, of the Bosnian War, which was fought much like the Lebanese Civil War, over the concept of who's going to be in charge of the country, because you had three communities that coexisted based on a very precarious sort of an ethnic key and quota system that you know you had to have one of each and, and rotating and, and power sharing and then one of these communities basically said no we don't think we're going to abide by this we're the majority we're the most numerous we're going to rule over everybody else that's how the war that's why the war started that's how the war started i'll die on this hill and from day one the bosnian muslims who later renamed themselves Bosniaks, their leader, Ali Izabegovic, his strategy from day one was to get an international intervention. And his model was Desert Storm, Kuwait 1991. Kuwait didn't really resist Iraq. The Iraqis just basically walked Rolled in. in. <clears throat> and then the Kuwaiti government in exile was like, okay, please defend us, you know, please fight the war for us, and came up with all of these propaganda uh, tricks like the incubator babies. The United States assembles a coalition, deploys this massive army in the Middle East, and then invades and ends the war in two weeks. That was the idea. You, we, we, we get the Americans to do the same thing for us. It was basically just spelled out. That was a strategy all along. Well, there are, I mean, there are a number of sources that claim that, that is, is a Begovic, which was the, he was the, the Bosniak um, uh, leader, uh, a, a, a Nazi and um, a religious fundamentalist who, I mean, there are a num number of sources who, who have explicitly stated that he told them that if 5,000 Muslims were killed in Srebrenica, this would lead to NATO intervention. I, I think one of, the, one of the sources was the Srebrenica chief of police. Yes. Mehul who's himself a Muslim, who, yeah. who lived to tell the tale. Um, but I'm, I'm sort of trying to rewind to like 1992, sure. because from the very start of the conflict, you had atrocity propaganda as one of the key uh, uh, pillars of strategy from Sarajevo. And they've tried everything from the infamous uh, concentration camp pictures that basically they found one man who was uh, and wasting, yeah, yeah. Was wasting disease. They positioned him outside of the chicken wire, shot, uh, reverse shot at it, and then basically declared this is you know Bergen Belsen ninety two. Mm. And tr they've tried everything. Neither the ICTY nor the ICJ agreed to any of this. Basically, the only instance of genocide that they could ever conjure into being mm. was Srebrenica. And this is what people forget, because again, like in 92, 93, there was talk of genocide all over the place, and this was, this was a key pillar of propaganda from Sarajevo to cause an international military intervention. The irony is that when Srebrenica happened, when the enclave was taken by Ser Bosnian Serb troops in July of 1995, that was already the middle of this big push by the US, specifically the US, and uh, the Croatian military, which the American diplomats at the time called our junkyard dogs, uh, to attack the Serbs in Kraina and basically obliterate these UN protected areas. Mm. That, was, that was about to happen in August. So nobody made a big fuss about Srebrenica at the time because it was inconvenient for their narrative. And it, in fact, this didn't become a thing until pretty much after the Dayton Peace Agreement was signed. Because you, you look at the transcripts and testimonies from Dayton, Srebrenica isn't even brought up. The Bosnian Muslims aren't asking for it back. They're asking for a land bridge to Gorazde, which is the only remaining Muslim-majority enclave on the Drina. They're asking for land around Sarajevo. They're asking for all these other things. But they're not asking for Srebrenica. It's not an issue for them at the time. It, had, it became an issue afterwards. Why? Because the, the American elections were over, the, you know, 24, uh, the, the 12 month mandate of the peacekeeping troops had expired, uh, Serbia was being set up for the 99 bombing because the team at the State Department wanted to finish the job. And so let's find a pretext to revise the Dayton Accords and invalidate them. 
You have the U.S. Embassy today saying Bosnia is not a union of two states. The Republic of Srpska only exists at Bosnia's sufferance. This is literally a misreading of the Dayton Peace Accord because the Dayton Peace Accords literally say otherwise. But again, we're, 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 we're look, you, you see who, who we're dealing with. We're dealing with people who are intentionally misreading their own treaties because they have no intention of abiding by them. And they needed a way to invalidate the existence of Republika Srpska because it was written down in an internationally binding agreement. Mm. And this was 30 years ago, so they weren't quite as willing as they are today to just simply trample the laws they don't, they don't like. It, they, there, there's been a road that took them there by now. Of course, today nobody would, would bat an eye at the U.S. violating wantonly international law because it does that and doesn't bat an eye. But 30 years ago, this was still a no-no. Why did they do this now? Isn't it obvious? Gaza. Obviously. And, and, and the, the, the saddest part of it all, the most horrifying in my mind, is that all of these Muslim-majority countries that voted in favor literally said, we absolutely understand that why you're doing this. You're, you're, you're tossing us a distraction from Gaza. We're, but we're going to keep objecting to what you're doing in Gaza and what you're supporting in Gaza, and we're going to vote for this anyway because religious solidarity. I, I feel bad for them because they're being taken for a ride. They're being used. But I, you know, I can't make decisions for them. That's their sovereign right if they want to be stupid about this. I'm just disappointed. But at the end of the day, minus these countries that literally spelled out that they're being cynical, the, the division came down to the globalist American empire and satellites on one side and the rest of the world on the other. And even though people who were behind this are publicly celebrating this as a victory, it should be ringing alarm bells from Brussels to Washington because it literally split the UN along the lines that they didn't want them to be split. Because it's a clear message was sent, because the Chinese and the Russians are usually far more diplomatic about this, and a lot of other countries, like Nicaragua, gave a really, really fiery speech about, you know, who are you to lecture us about genocides? You had, you had several other countries who were very much, uh, you know, they, just about everybody who spoke in the General Assembly was like, we see what you're trying to do. And they said it publicly. And this is the kind of sunlight that this kind of plot absolutely does not abide. And so, yeah, I'm, I'm not quite willing to um, go along with President Vucic's narrative that this was a great victory, because it wasn't. But it was absolutely, at best, a pyrrhic victory for the empire, because the key to its global hegemony is for the people being hegemonized uh, never to realize what's being done. They must be unknowingly going along. And at, at best, you've had people knowingly going along with, with this ploy and telling the entire world about it. And that's not how this empire works. Yeah. Well, I mean, I mean, in, in, funnily enough, like the, in the UN vote on the US intervention in Iraq, in Iraq in, 19, in 1990, um, <clears throat> the, the two countries that voted against it was Cuba and Yemen and the US ambassador told the Yemeni ambassador that's the most expensive vote you'll ever cast and then severely punished them economically as a result for daring to step out of line. Do you think that... laughing now, <laughs> considering that the Yemenis have single-handedly checkmated the entire global shipping industry, or rather, let me revise that, Western global shipping industry, mm -hmm. because last I checked, the Russian-owned or Chinese-owned vessels had absolutely no problem going through the Red Sea or past the Houthis, and anything British, American, NATO, or Israeli is still being blocked or attacked by missiles if they dare sa sail anywhere near there. I mean, how's that Prosperity Guardian operation working for you? I mean, it's not prospering. So. Well, <laughs> but, but it's one of those. Yes, the, the American ambassador, famous last words. You know, this is going to cost you dearly. Thirty, you know, forty years later. 
who's laughing now? Yeah. I mean, these things have a way of coming around, which, which you know, yes, okay, the Washington establishment is ahistorical, and, and, they, and they always think, oh, it's going to be different this time. Uh, and it never is different, is it? Never. Um, I mean, we, we've just had uh, Karim Khan, who is the um, a, 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 a ICC prosecutor, the ICC being uh, an ad hoc successor to the uh, uh, criminal tri tribunal for the former Yugoslavia, and w w which which Khan worked on. Um, he's admit um, he, he 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 said in a TV interview that um, he was threatened to not go after Netanyahu, and that the the ICC is for Africans and for thugs like. Putin, um, not the West and its uh, its assorted puppets and proxies. Um, I mean, this seems to uh, this this seems to be the ethos, does it not? Still, right. Well, I mean, it's the whole point of the rules based world order that you know those who make the rules don't are above the law. Uh, mm. Which again, the, most of the rest of the world has figured out and is not necessarily willing to go along with anymore. Uh, the sheer amount of self delegitimization that the American Empire, the globalist mm -hmm. American Empire, has done over the past month alone is baffling to me. Like the whole, let's have a, let's have a, let, let, put it this way the UN General Assembly recently voted overwhelmingly, overwhelmingly, to back Palestinian statehood and admission to, and, and UN membership. Just overwhelmingly. And the U.S. goes, no, no, you can't do that. Uh, we don't recognize your vote. We're going to veto it in the Security Council. And uh, this shouldn't be done unilaterally. Any Palestinian statehood needs to be a, a result of a negotiated se settlement between Israel and the Palestinians. Noble sentiment, except that Moscow asked, wait a second, where was the negotiated settlement in case of Kosovo? There wasn't one because the U.S. just decided to unilaterally declare its conquered territory in an mm. independent state. And then when the International Court of Justice was asked about it, very specifically by Serbia, it changed the question. What people don't realize is that, you know, 2007-8, when this came up, uh, Serbia sent to the UN a request to seek a clarifying opinion from the ICJ and actually got approval in the General Assembly, of all things. And they sent the question, you know, was it, was it appropriate and legal for the provisional government acting under UN Resolution uh, 1244 to declare independence. And the International Court of Justice, which some African judges later publicly admitted that, that committed a slight, judicial sleight of hand is, is how they called it, basically said, well, if it's a provisional government acting under UN authority, clearly no, because it's illegal. But we're going to call them a group of citizens instead and say that that's strictly speaking not illegal. And this is how the International Court of Justice, which is actually a legitimate international court, under tremendous US pressure, arm twisting and the like, ruled that Kosovo's independence was legal. It wasn't. They literally redefined the question so the answer would be yes. Now you have the ICC, which is a bastard child of ICTY, which actually does have an internationally recognized statute. Like it's a, it's a proper court in the sense that there's a treaty that countries have signed up on, uh, signed up to. Except, who are the countries that did not sign the treaty? Russia, for one. Ukraine. Israel. The US. Who did sign to the Rome Statute? The Palestinian Authority. So by the actual rules that the West should be obligated to accept, because they're their own rules, the ICC has jurisdiction over the West Bank and Gaza. Whether you like it or not, that's the rules. And now the U.S. is saying, well, you know, you don't have the you don't have jurisdiction because because Israel, because we say so. I'm sorry, but those are your own rules. And just like you never issue an order, you know, cannot be obeyed because that destroys your authority. You cannot claim to be an enforcer of laws and rules if you don't if you don't want to abide by them yourself. You're a crooked cop then. 
Yeah, good analogy. I, I mean, I, I think as well that, that there was a uh, there was a February nineteen ninety three CIA memo which explicitly proposed creating um, a, a war crimes tribunal um, for the purpose of publicising Serbian atrocities, and it, and it very explicitly warned against um, uh, even mentioning uh, Bosniak transgressions. Um, and I think that this has helped further and cement this notion that the, the Bosniaks were the Jews in the Holocaust or like the, the, the Palestinians, um, uh, just completely innocent victims of, of um, Serb imperialism and genocide. Um, I mean, what, what's your take on the, the notion that the entire war was genocidal in nature, which some people claim? No, it's absurd. It wasn't. The war was not genocidal in nature. It was a sectarian conflict in fought over land, not even on the principles of who's going to govern the country, because um, the, the thing that they agreed on, that all sides agreed on in the end, is to partition it. That's what the Dayton Peace Agreement is. It's a, it's a demarcation of borders. And the Bosnian Muslims, for all of their insistence otherwise, accepted the idea of, of ethnic partition and yeah. ethnic sovereignty. They did. It's in the treaty. Uh, so that Bosnia's independence as such was never really in question. Mm. Uh, the only question was whether Bosnia would exist as a state or would, would it bro- break up into independent statelets. And what the Dayton Agreement did in the end was say, okay, fine, you can have sort of a general outline of a, of a state uh, and then you can have your ethnic statelets functioning inside it. The fact that one side couldn't get their ethnic state to function isn't really relevant to the text of the treaty. That's a you problem, as, as, as we say in the business. But, the, again, the whole accusation of genocide was a pillar of propaganda, of, of strategy, to get the West involved in the war. It's, it's an objectively true fact. And so the talk of genocide was furthering that ambition. And the fact that the ICTY was explicitly founded to put the Serbs on trial and all the other prosecutions were ancillary at best. And most of those, uh, first of all, they went after local commanders and, and junior officials. The few senior officials that they put on trial were accused of uh, the equivalent of a speeding ticket. I mean, mm-hmm. you've, you've got people, you know, of all the atrocities, for example, that the Bosnian Muslim military committed, they put its commanding general on trial for executions of a handful of Croatian prisoners. Mm-hmm. It was, it, it's abs- I mean, war crimes against Serbian civilians, according to the ICTY, didn't happen. Um, you know, it, it, essentially, like, the, the Croats were convicted of attacking Muslims, Muslims were convicted, if ever, of maybe attacking Croats. Mm. Serbs were convicted of everything, and no attack on Serbs ever was punished. It's it's how the ICTY mm. uh, judgments came down. I, better lawyers than me and more recognized legal authorities have argued pretty convincingly that the ICTY was illegitimate mm. because the Security Council that created it that rubber stamped the CIA yeah. proposal to create it, had no judiciary powers to delegate. Yeah. It's also part of the UN constitution that they, they can't make courts, isn't it? Right. So, <coughs> they, and they just violated that and made a court anyway, mm-hmm. because they said, oh, well, these are, you know, extraordinary circumstances. Well, you would think that that would mean you have to do better in extraordinary circumstances, but no. And they did the same thing with Rwanda. It, and, and for a while there... Uh, there, the Obama administration went with this whole there are genocides everywhere and we're a knight in shining armor that's going around the world ending them sort of a retcon of World War II history and the role of the American Empire in the world but I don't think the people who wrote that actually believe their own BS maybe they, they eventually came to believe you know drink their, own, drink their own Kool-Aid and believe their own propaganda but it was cynical from the get go because again if you define everything as genocide nothing really is yeah, I mean, uh, I mean, on the subject of, uh, of uh, crimes against Serbs not being prosecuted, uh, you have Nasser Oric, uh, who was a uh, Bosniak military commander, who had this fearsome reputation for taking no prison- mm-hmm. prisoners, torturing, mutilating and murdering uh, prisoners of war and uh, uh, civilians alike, 
uh, and used Srebrenica as a staging post um, for, for attacks on on Serb villages, including on Orthodox Christmas, which you know went down really well um, with uh, with the Serbs. Um, but yeah, like he showed um, Western journalists videos of um, his quote unquote greatest hits, like you know, like beheaded. Um, uh, beheaded Serbs, uh, the, the pe- people that they killed with explosives, people they've like skewered on spikes and grilled um, on, on, um, uh, on, on spits, and then at the ICTY he was. Um, uh, what was his? What was he tried for? I believe um, he was put on trial for torturing. For it was inhu- inhumane treatment of right. prisoners. It was. It, he was. He was charged with not stopping the inhumane treatment of prisoners. Yes. That underlings committed. Mm. It's, it's one of those, are you kidding me? But then again, you know, I, I hold that the ICUI is legitimate, and I'm not surprised that, that he was eventually acquitted, at yeah. least, for lack of evidence. Um, <laughs> yeah. Because, again, we're, what we're dealing with is... I mean, and Orange's case is, is interesting, because, he has, as, as you said, I've, I've read the uh, Greatest Hits article myself back in the day, and uh, I'm amazed that all of these Western journalists who wrote this and witnessed this very elegantly memory hold it and pretend it never happened. Yeah. Well, there, I mean, How do they sleep sorry. at night? I don't know. But <laughs> On top of a pile of money. Yeah, um, but Orich... Um, Orich was actually evacuated from Srebrenica months ahead of July 11th. Mm. The most interesting part well one of the most interesting parts because another one just came up recently courtesy of some British documents is that Orich and the entire command of the 28th Division were airlifted Mm. by helicopters, secretly, uh, ahead of time. It's it's almost as if the leadership in Sarajevo knew that something was about to happen or had prepared for something to happen and they wanted to pull them out and leave the division both without command but also save these people for something else in the future. Mm. And... They literally airlifted the entire leadership and left these people to fend for themselves. Yeah. That's that's one really interesting detail that nobody's ever explained. Yeah. The other one is apparently there was a SAS team present on the ground that even the Dutch peacekeepers that were charged with safeguarding the, the UN protected area were leery of and were basically kept at arm's length from and these people came and went uh, on their own, they, they were not reporting to anybody, they were basically operating on London's orders, and the Dutch were completely in the dark. Yeah. And and they would sometimes go out and you know maybe join Orange's people, we don't know. Mm. And they had these you know, classified reports that have just recently surfaced, courtesy of certain investigative journalists, <laughs> um, that you know don't clarify what they were doing, but they were definitely up to something. I, 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 you know, I, I'm loath to believe that they were out there for the you know, bird watching and picking flowers. <laughs> Yeah. Well, so, I mean, form, formally, the, the, their task was was intelligence gathering, and yet there, you have this Dutch government report which states that, that the 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 Dutch peacekeepers were scared of the British and thought that they could start World War Three, um, which is a rather strange appraisal if the, all they were doing was um, gathering intelligence. And yet, there is also, um, as I've reported on, um, a declassified Ministry of Defence file wh- where it, where they openly talk about. Um, I think it was it was about a month before the uh, the attack on Srebrenica happened that the, the, the MI, MI6 um, f- felt that it f- believed that a, a strike was coming from Serb forces on Srebrenica. I mean, this is bef- many weeks before this uh, the, the the attack on Srebrenica was actually planned. Um, well, obviously, the, the, the evacuation of the command staff would have been their first clue. Even the MI6 could miss that. Yeah, yeah. and it's like the, the, I, I mean, there's also you have a, a Bosniak MP who was the, the uh, a founding member of the uh, the SDA, which is the the uh, the is, is, is it Begovic's party. party, and 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 who was from Srebrenica, who opened the party's local branch there. Um, and in 1996, he told the Sarajevo newspaper. The betrayal of Srebrenica was consciously prepared by the Bosnian presidency and the army command. Many more inhabitants of Srebrenica would be alive today if I was not prevented by a group of criminals. Orich's actions were, he declared, a conscious giving of a pretext to Serb forces to attack. Because this was a Muslim-majority enclave surrounded on all sides by enemy, uh, by, by enemy territory. And it was basically undefended. Um, so, I mean, when you, it, it, it was, it's 
seems to have been well understood that using it as a staging post, particularly for extremely brutal um, attacks on civilians, was going to lead to an absolutely brutal um, counterattack. I mean, Marillon, who I mentioned, apparently warned, claims to have warned uh, Milosevic in 1993 that this would happen and the Serbs will be, become demons um, well, as a result. So, so <coughs> that, that's, it's a good thing you mentioned this. So, 93 is when this big battle in eastern Bosnia happens along the Drina and the Muslim forces are pretty much decisively defeated. And they're, uh, they basically end up in these three enclaves, Srebrenica, Zepa and Gorazde. And the UN acting as it did at the time, basically gets through with humanitarian aid and food supplies and finds all these soldiers and, you know, um, uh, troops and farmers and civilians and says, okay, well, you know, we, can, we can evacuate the civilians to safety uh, because one thing people don't understand perhaps is that at the, at the very early stages of the war in Bosnia, you had certain towns uh, evacuated by the local authorities. For example, I uh, personally heard stories of Bosnian Muslims getting evacuated, like the, S the SDA party organizing evacuations from certain towns uh, because they were Serb majority, they had no aspirations to control them, they had no hope of holding them. So like, okay, get on the bus, we're going to, you know, Bosnian territory, you're all becoming refugees. And people were like, well, I mean, I don't want to get killed, so I better flee to safety. <coughs> uh, there, there was a mass amount of movement of people in the early days because people were like, well, we'll just, we'll just leave for a few weeks until this boils over and see what happens. And then they end up getting stuck. So the UN, Morio specifically, says, well, I, why don't we just evacuate the civilians? And Oric says, no. Yeah, they were prevented from doing so. Nobody is leaving. <coughs> They all must stay here. And Mario's like, well, how, 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 how are you going to feed them? Oh, you will feed us. The whole concept was keeping these people there because if you keep them there, you keep the territory. Because if you evacuate them, you become a military target. And then, of course, you're fair game for, for, for a battle. He, Orange was literally using these people as human shields, which was what appalled Mario, among other people. But what happens is the UN is like, okay, we're going to set up six protected areas for civilians, uh, the three in eastern Bosnia, and then Tuzla, Sarajevo, and Bihać. All six are Bosnian Muslim strongholds. Tuzla, Sarajevo, and Bihać specifically are core headquarters, something like 10,000 troops each. And essentially, you, you set up bases for the Bosnian Muslim military to attack from with impunity. And they cannot be pursued into them because the UN troops are uh, set around the perimeter. And you've got NATO patrolling the skies because it was originally supposed to protect the no-fly zone that was created on a false pretext because the Bosnian Croats shot down an Italian humanitarian plane and they blamed the Serbs. So NATO must do something, no-fly zone. Uh, so you've got NATO, which is, has helpfully offered to enforce this for the UN, usurping the UN's power, which was a sort of an ongoing thing throughout the Bosnian War, saying, oh, we'll do this, we'll enforce this, we'll bomb the ground targets. First wartime mission in the alliance's history ever. And so you've basically got a, this, this creeping intervention. The, the, the greatest irony, and I know I'm jumping all over the place, but the greatest irony is that Zizabegovic eventually got what he was, look, what he was asking for, just not in the way he envisioned. And it, it ended up the West using him, because if you read Holbrook's memoirs from Dayton, and Holbrook an was an interesting character. He, he was not a nice guy, he was not a good man, but he never tried to lie to protect his reputation. He mm. was a bit of a thug, and he told you what he thought, because he was very like, full, oh. Very full for right. Yeah. I was like, I hate you, and I'm going to tell you about it, because what can you do? All right, I respect that. And so in his memoirs, he's literally outlining the greatest success of the Dayton Peace Agreement is that the U.S. Has, has reasserted its dominance in Europe again. Oh, wait a second, I thought your mission was to end the war and the bloodshed. Oh, yeah, no, that too. <laughs> but, like, the whole point of the U.S. involvement was to keep the, the Europeans in their designated place in this new world order, to, to, to sideline the U.N., 
you know, to, to cozy up to the Muslim world that was angry after the first Iraq war. And, and they thought they accomplished all of this. And in fact, as Brendan O'Neill pointed out uh, many years later, it literally globalized jihad from Afghanistan because that wrapped up in 1992 with the fall of the Soviet-backed government, which held on for like, what is it, three, four years yeah. before, the, before the Mujahideen took, uh, dis destroyed it yeah. and then started fighting between each other. And all of a sudden, all of these Western encouraged jihadists from all over the place, such as freedom fighter Osama bin Laden, on the road, the uh, warrior uh, on the road the, to peace. A Bosnian citizen, yes. Um, <laughs> they're like, well, what are we going to do next? Oh, here's Bosnia. And guess what? The Western propaganda, which is intended to hype up Western audiences, the Europeans and Americans, for intervention and failed, has, this, has created this narrative about you know, the West not doing anything to defend innocent, weak Muslims from, from weak, evil Serbs committing genocide against them, and literally, literally radicalized tens of thousands of jihadists. I believe Majid Nawaz actually said that he was radicalized by, by uh, stories of the Bosnian genocide and then joined the, was it the Muslim Brotherhood yeah. and then ended up in, in prison and ended up seeing the error of his ways. But like, you've, you've literally got testimonials from people who, who fell for this. Whereas the Western, the, the Americans didn't get in much of an appetite for military intervention. The Western Europeans certainly didn't have much of an appetite. And their government's really pushing for this because that would give them some kind of you know, legitimacy as knights in shining armor. But again, that propaganda horrendously backfired and we end up getting 9-11, we end up getting the, the, the Taliban again yeah. and, and the whole Afghanistan fiasco and the second Iraq invasion and ISIS. Um, I mean, All of this can be traced to the 1990s to this you know, propaganda that I don't think inflamed the jihadists on purpose, but that was its effect. Because yeah. I think it was intended to propagandize the Western audience, the Western public opinion, to get on board with this imperialist agenda, which, you know, King and Crystal in 96, 95 def defined as benevolent global hegemony uh, forever. But they were, they were thinking, you know, they were making policy recommendations for Clinton. Like this is, this, this was, you know, these are neocons. They're advising Democrats because empire is a bipartisan issue. So, but by the time Zbigniew gets his intervention, in 95, he's been used. He's no longer necessary. And his cause, the idea that he's going to control all of Bosnia and bring back the Ottoman Empire of 1876, is not interesting anymore. Americans have achieved their goal. They're going to they're going to stop. They're going to consolidate their gains, and they're going to push later after the election, after Bill Clinton gets reelected. And he got a worse deal than any yeah, prior absolutely. Uh, he would have peace got, proposal. He um, would have gotten a much better <coughs> deal. In March 1992, because the EU proposed plan had Bosnia independent, which was a big concession for the Serbs and Croats. Huge, yeah. Uh, but also partitioned in these three ethnic provinces. And by this partition, the Muslims would have gotten a lot more land. Yeah. I believe under the current arrangement, they controlled like something like 23% of the entire, of the country's entire territory. Mm. The Serbs are at 49 or a little less because of some border changes yeah. by the American viceroys later, but, and the Croats control a disproportionate share uh, to their population, but that's, again, that's a federation problem. Uh, but the, the Muslims got a raw deal, but this is what they wanted. That's the monkey's paw they got with their wish. But perhaps mo the worst thing that happened to them, and I've on, I'm on record uh, writing this over many, many years, it's not the land issue that's, the, that's, that's really the rough part. It's that they ended up as a collective, as an, as an ethnos, defined by Izbegovic's wartime narrative and propaganda. They loathe his family. Like his son, who eventually took over the party, ended up getting metaphorically run out of town on a rail because his wife was so corrupt that they wouldn't give her the time of day. She ruined medicine in, in the Muslim-controlled part of Bosnia. Uh, but they don't have the stomach for him or his family, but his father's no concept of who they are as a people is, is considered sacred. The, th the three people who sat on behalf of Bosnia illegally, 
because by the Bosnian constitution, this had to be a consensus decision of the presidency, and the Serbs did not consent. But the three people who sat in the UN celebrating this were once members of the Social Democrats, which was a party that uh, was a successor to the communists. And they were all theoretically declared uh, non-nationalist, secular, modernist, civic society types. And yet here they are enforcing Izabegovic's vision. That is the truly horrifying, because that vision is extremely negative. This, this self-definition that they've embraced, by for, that was forced on them by their own leadership, is, is rooted in hatred and grievance. It's, it's not a positive identity, it's, a, it's an extremely negative identity. It keeps them unhappy, it keeps them poor, it, it keeps them crooked, in thrall of crooked politicians mm -hmm. who are looting them, and it, it offers zero ability to connect with their neighbors. Basically, the only way out of this is if the Serbs and Croats magically disappear overnight. <laughs> They lack, the, they lack the force to do this, so they're hoping somebody else will do it for them. Whether it's the West, or it's the, it's the Turks, or the Arabs, or, some, or the Iranians, or somebody else. But this is, this, is, this, is, you know, this is their vision of the future, and it's a bleak one. And it's, it explains why they're constantly miserable. What do you think, what do you think is the future of, of Bosnia and Herzegovina and Re Republika Srpska? I mean, what I, what I would prefer to happen is for the people, all three communities, to see reason and realize that they have to live with each other, either as good neighbors across some really short good fences, or as frenemies over some longer, taller fences, but that their neighbors aren't going anywhere. Mm. And to have a little bit of dignity as opposed to you know, rushing to lick the boot of every conqueror that comes along. And you know who you are, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna spell it out. But you know, what's, what's going to happen most likely, and this, this is what I would like to see, but this is what's probably going to happen, because I can recognize likelihoods and probabilities, is that Republika Srpska is going to say, okay, the Bosnian Muslims, the Bosniaks, have just demonstrated to us that they don't abide by the constitution, they don't abide by the Dayton Peace Accord. They don't want to live with us. They hate us. So we're leaving. We have our state. They have their rump, whatever. We're just, we're just, we're just leaving. Our now goal is a union with Serbia. You can't do that! It's going to be the scream from the American Embassy. Why exactly? Oh, the Dayton Agreement. You mean the one that you were violating? <laughs> the one that the Bosnian Muslims refuse to abide by? And are trying to destroy. Right. Yeah. Um, so, so <clears throat> what do you, what do you propose to do? Sanction them harder? Bomb them again? With what military? Have you checked your stockpiles lately? Yeah, well, I mean, I think uh, on um, uh, Republic of Serbia's um, Independence uh, Day, uh, they were ha they were uh, there was a, there was a, a public celebration, and there was like one F thirty five fighter jet like hovering menacingly above. I mean, of course, they didn't care. <laughs> like, I mean, people on the ground. Um, yeah, I mean, do, I mean, do, w w what could the empire do? Sanctions? No. Well, the problem is that objectively, to us who have who are aware of the actual state of affairs in the world, and you know the the military power and power projection algorithms and all of this stuff, it's obvious that the empire doesn't have the wherewithal to enforce its writ like the way it did 30 years ago. However, the problem is the empire doesn't understand this. And in this post-truth world order, it doesn't matter what is, it matters what people think is. Mm. Now, again, there, a, lot, a lot can fit into this gap between wishful thinking and reality. But the biggest problem right now is that, have you ever watched those Wile E. Coyote and Roadrunner cartoons? <laughs> yes. You know that there's a delay between Coyote running over a cliff and hovering in the air yeah. and realizing that there's nothing beneath him? <laughs> we haven't hit the point where he realizes there's nothing between him and drops down. But he's, he's already running in empty air across, mm. over a cliff. And this is, this is the situation we're in right now. And by we, I mean the globe, I mean humanity. The globalist American empire has run off the cliff and is about to look down and realize there's nothing beneath me. But they haven't done that yet. They still think 
that they're the you know, richest, strongest, most powerful, most legitimate, you name it, they think so of themselves. They are not aware of their own limitations. And so they're going to act irrationally, stupidly, and destructively. They can still do harm. They, they cannot create the world as they wish it to be, but they can hurt a lot of people in the process. They can go out swinging. Right. And so, so far, the Serb strategy was to sit and wait and, you know, adopt the Taliban approach in the sense of, you know, we've got the watches, we've got the time, because we live here, we've always lived here, and you're just the latest in the series of conquerors we've seen off. Mm. You know, ask today, where is the Ottoman Empire or Austria-Hungary or the Nazi Reich? Mm. All of whom have done damage, tremendous damage, but they're gone. So will the globalist American Empire be one day. But again, the empire is stupid enough to keep provoking and pushing and prodding and, and forcing some kind of confrontation because it wants one, because it thinks it can win it. It can't. But again, they're too daft to realize it yet and therein lies the problem. And on that bombshell, um, yeah, we've taken up enough of your time as it is, I think. Um, no, but thank you very much for coming on Active Measures. Um, always a pleasure, never a burden. Thank you very God much bless for you. having me. Hey, everyone. Um, if you enjoyed this video or, or any of our other content, uh, please give us a follow on Twitter or subscribe to us on YouTube. It will help us beat the algorithm oligarchs. Thank you.